Hello from New York City and welcome to the Food Fix, Super Plants, Microbe Sidekicks and Nutrient Heroes. I am Eva Bosbach, Executive Director of the University of Cologne New York office, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our second Transatlantic Tandem Talk, part of a series held on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the North America office of the University of Cologne. We host the series in cooperation with our partners, the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH New York, the German Consulate General, German Academic Exchange Service, DAAD New York, Deutsches Haus at NYU, 1014 Space for Ideas, the Goethe Institute New York, the German Embassy in Washington DC, America House NRW, Wunderbar Together, and last but not least, the German Research Foundation, DFK North America. And with this, it is my pleasure to hand the floor over to its director, Dr. Georg Bechtold, for his welcoming remarks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eva. Hello, everyone. My name is Georg Bechtold, as you just heard. I'm the representative of the German Research Foundation in North America. The DFG, as we abbreviate it in German, corresponds to the National Science Foundation in the US. We offer funding to German researchers in any field of science and in the humanities for research projects of their choosing. Our organization celebrated its 100th birthday um, or anniversary last year, but uh, the party had to be postponed to a later date, hopefully later this year. In any case, historically, we have been very proud to contribute to the fact that the average quality of German science was quite high. On the contrary, the US historically has focused more on just a few universities, but outstanding ones. In the beginning of the new millennium, German science policy looked for a combination of these different approaches, finally arriving at the so-called excellence strategy of the federal and state governments. One part of this strategy is to fund so-called clusters of excellence. Clusters of Excellence stand for project-based funding in internationally competitive fields of research at universities or university consortia. The proposals are reviewed and decided upon in an academically driven, highly competitive process. A total of approximately 385 million euro is available annually for Clusters of Excellence. The Excellence Commission decided on funding of 57 clusters of excellence starting on January 2019, and each of the clusters is funded by an average of $8 million per year for a period of seven years. The Cluster of Excellence on Plant Sciences, CEPLAS, is situated at the University of Cologne, and I will come this opportunity to listen together with you to one of the PIs of this cluster, Professor Alga Sukaro, and her colleague Mechthild Tegeda from Washington State University, as they tell us about a highly interesting subject that certainly will challenge us in the not so distant future. I'm pretty sure we have an exciting 57 minutes ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georg. And the floor now is go to Katrin, and now goes to Katrin Di Paola, program manager from the DWIH New York. Thank you so much. And Georg, I'm taking away another two of those 57 minutes. I'm sorry for that. I apologize. But it's amazing to see such a large audience and so many little grids. I hope you're, uh, you're using the grid view. It's fantastic. So thank you for having us uh, for lunch in the United States and for dinner in Germany, if you're, if you're watching us from there. So as Eva said, I'm Catherine. I'm the program manager here at the DVEH, as we call it, the German Center for Research and Innovation. And I'm here with my two colleagues, Julia and uh, Bruno, who make sure that everything on the tech side is also gonna work for us today. So I'm super happy to co-host the program uh, with Eva and the University of Cologne in her tandem series, very successful series in our program. And also, of course, with Georg and Dana from the DFG. It's an honor to be here with you guys and an honor to be with here with all of you and, of course, our distinguished guests. So the, the German Center for Research and Innovation actually exists five times on this planet. So we're here in New York City, we're in Tokyo, we're in New Delhi, we're in Sao Paulo, and we're also in Moscow. 
And our, our mission is basically to showcase innovation and collaboration on an international stage. So we are like your, we're like your little shop window to the outside to show um, what fantastic research is being done in our case on both sides of the um, Atlantic. Of course, the topic today is a crucial one for all of us. Um, and we're very excited to, to tackle or to hear a little bit more about the, the global food systems and how that's going to work in the future. And um, not only in terms of what are all the challenges, but also what are the vast opportunities that we have in terms of finding new technologies and also new research that is being done to combat this, this looming crisis that we're looking at. And when I say um, technology, that's actually my, the segue to my purpose here today, because I'm going to guide you through how um, our WebEx system works really quickly in one minute to give you the best viewing and um, event experience that you could possibly have. So let's start and bear with me for one more minute. If you go to your left, upper left, and you see a little button that says view, I would highly encourage you to press it now and then go to where it says themes all the way at the bottom and switch to dark mode. You'll see it's much more comfortable to the eye if you have the dark background as opposed to the gray default background. If you move to the right, you will find the little icon, the little button that says layout, and then you can switch between the grid or just having the presenter or whatever you feel most comfortable. By the way, thank you very much for most of you for turning on the cameras, because this is really nice for the presenters actually seeing somebody, not just an empty grid and the name. So thanks to the audience for that. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you have your usual buttons for mute and stop your video. And then there's one little button that has an icon with a smiley face. I would highly encourage you, not because it's fun, but it's also um, a nice interactive way to letting the presenters know that you're following, that you're agreeing or disagreeing. Press it and see what kind of reactions you can actually have during the talk. And Julia just pressed one and I see somebody else, Stefan. Yeah, I see. Perfect. You got it. So feel free to make use of that. And then, of course, uh, you can always see uh, who the participants are and, you know, and, and check there. And then also use the chat function later for the moderated session. And the rules for that will be given by Eva in a, in a moment. And with that, I hand over to you again. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Catherine. This is all very useful. We will now turn to our speakers and the topic, which is very exciting to me for two reasons. First, because both of our speakers are doing research on areas touching on truly global essential questions, such as how are we going to feed 9 billion people on our planet by 2050, while at the same time protecting our environment? And secondly, it is exciting to me because this tandem talk is part of something bigger that we at the University of Cologne in Germany support with all our internationalization efforts, including our offices in China, India, and here in North America. We bring scientists and the interested public here from Germany and the US together to discuss cutting edge research, to explore globally relevant topics and to expand partnerships. Because just like plants, good partnerships grow. And so does the research collaboration in plant science between the Washington State University and the cluster of excellence A plus at the University of Cologne. We held the first transatlantic workshop on plant sciences here at the German House in New York in 2017 Subsequently, a delegation of graduate students from Washington State University attended the first international C plus summer school near Cologne. And today, this tandem talk is not only part of our series to celebrate the 10th anniversary of our North America office, but at the same time marks a launch of a new virtual seminar series between the two universities about advances that help feed and sustain our world. So here is Alga Zukara, Professor of Microbial Ecological Genetics at the Institute for, Institute for Plant Sciences at the University of Cologne, and one of the CEPLAS Research Areas Coordinators, and Mechtil Tegeda, Distinguished Professor in Plant Molecular Physiology at the School of Biological Sciences at the Washington State University. You will hear from both speakers first, and we will continue with the Q&A session after the presentations. Enjoy. So many thanks, Eva, for the kind introduction and uh, 
to all of you for organizing this uh, event. And uh, good morning and good afternoon. I'm Alga Zucaro from the University of Cologne. And in this first presentation, I'm going to focus on the microbe sidekick. So I'm a PI in CEPLAS. This is the cluster of excellence on plant sciences. And I am the coordinator of research area two in plant microbiota, nutritional networks, and adaptive adaptation. Now, our mission in CEPLAS is to develop solutions for sustainable food security through excellent fundamental plant research. And we are deeply involved in training the next generation of plant scientists and in creating a highly qualified and active plant microbe research community. In CEPLAS, we want to understand and predict our plant performance and performance and reproductive success depend on the integration of developmental decisions with metabolism, and this at different scales, and how microbiota contribute to plant performance and adaptation to specific environmental conditions. This includes also different soil types. Now, just to put our research into context, we are interested in plant microbe research because we strongly believe that this can contribute to sustainable solutions in agriculture. And as you know, the Green Revolution, which started in the 60s, enabled global food production to keep pace with the growing world population. And this actually was achieved to due to important advances in breeding. And this was combined with heavy use of synthetic nitrogen and rock phosphate fertilizers. Indeed, the use of fertilizer increased by 800% from the 60s. This has, of course, negative consequences on the environment, especially considering the fact that phosphate is a non-renewable natural resource. So to feed the expected additional 2 billion people by the year 2050, which is over 200 times the population of New York City, and to achieve the sustainable development goal number two, which is zero hunger by 2030, we need to change our food production system. So business as usual is not an option any longer. And to do things differently, we need to think differently. So we have framed the problem, but can we now come up with some possible solutions? In the first Green Revolution, this was successful because of the development of high-yielding semi-dwarf crop plants that are lodging resistant even under high fertilization regimes. So this was initiated by the breeder Norman Borlaug, who was awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his contributions to the world food supply. So the production of the three most important crops, which is rice, corn, and wheat, triplicated since then without a strong increase in agriculture production area. So this is actually a very strong uh, achievement. But as mentioned to you, to meet the zero hunger goal, we need a second green revolution to make agriculture sustainable again. And we are facing here the challenge to achieve these higher yields under climate change. And this will, of course, lead to increased treats from old, but also from new pests and pathogens. And additionally, we need to improve food nutritional quality. And a nice example is given by golden rice. This was developed through genetic engineering, and it contains practically three heterologous genes, two from bacteria and one from maize. And this leads to the production of beta carotene. This is the reason why it is orange. And this is the pro-vitamin A. And this is important in vitamin A deficient communities like in Asia. But as we need to change the fertilization regimes, I strongly believe that these goals can only be achieved by focusing on root function and morphology. So this leads us directly to the next generation applications of biologicals. These are beneficial bacteria and fungi or substances that derive from them that can help prevent disease and pests while contributing not only to plant health, but also to crop quality and yield. 
So these biologicals need to be robust and reliable and research on biologicals focuses on the understanding the complex relationships between plants and beneficial microbes, but also between microbes and microbes to enable the development of products to complement traditional farming strategies. So if you think that most soil is saturated with microorganisms and a tablespoon of soil could contain as many as 50 billion of them, you can imagine the agronomic and ecological potential still hidden behind the microbial diversity in terms of novel species, germs, and metabolic pathways. But to develop new biologicals, we need to understand the molecular and biological basis of plant microbe communication in the environment. And this is where research area two from CEPLAS is focusing on. But besides implementing biologicals as sustainable solution, enhanced agricultural production through innovative breeding technology is urgently needed to increase access to nutritious food worldwide, but also to more resistant plants to uh, specific treats. So here just I show the cross breeding together with mutation breeding. These were the moving forces behind the first green revolution. And here I just give a specific uh, example of the trait disease resistance, which is improved through crossing an elite recipient line with a donor line and selecting outstanding progeny with the desired traits. This, of course, is an excellent approach, but requires some time. And the recent advan advances in CRISPR-Cas genome editing enable efficient targeted modification in most crops. And this can happen in a faster and precise way by modifying the target genes or regulatory elements. But with this approach, you can even rearrange chromosomes in elite varieties. But of course, to achieve your specific traits, you need to know the gene or at least the genes that are behind this trait. And a nice example of successful breeding use both methods is MLO. This is Meldio resistance locus O. And MLO belongs to a family of Integra plasma membrane proteins. And it was originally described in Podromelio resistant barley mutant in the 19. 42, and since then have been implemented in several uh, other uh, plant species. The loss of barley MLO, in fact, is known to confer durable and robust resistance to powder milio. And recently, it was introduced also in wheat, that you, you can imagine this is an exaploid uh, plant, and also in grape wine via CRISPR-Cas genome editing. So this shows that CRISPR-Cas genome, genome editing uh, technology can be successfully used uh, to induce targeted mutations in genes of interest to improve traits of economic importance. But why I'm giving this example is because despite having some yield penalties, more than half of the spring barley commercially grown in Central Europe is largely immune to podromilio. And this is due to the introgression of MLO resistance into a broad panel of barley varieties. Now, what is different here in Europe compared to, um, to USA is that we use quite high amount of fertilizers in our field. And uh, this covers eventual effects that um, can be discovered only if we test these plants for accommodation of beneficial microorganisms. So this actually leaves still an open question that is, can we increase crop resistance to pathogens without compromising the ability to accommodate beneficial microbes? And in order to answer these questions, what we do in our work is to work with root endophytic fungi. These are beneficial fungi of the order Sebacinales. This is a group of fungi that has a broad host plant range. And depending on the host species, they can undergo mycorrhizal associations, but also grow as root endophytic fungi without, the, uh, without forming any peculiar structures. And therefore, they have been overlooked for many years in ecological studies. But we now know that fungi that belong to the order Sebacinales play a key role in shaping terrestrial ecosystems. And they are widely distributed in different plant hosts. 
We are interested in this group of fungi because they can display beneficial effects such as growth promotion and protection in different experimental hosts, including also the non-mycorrhizal host plant Arabidopsis thaliana, but also the crop plant barley, as we can see here in this uh, picture. But coming back to the MLO story, what we have done was to challenge uh, barley with our uh, root endophytic fungus. And uh, this fungus can successfully colonize the roots of barley. But at the early colonization time points, it induces a small and transient uh, immune response. And the hallmark of this immune response is the production of papillae. These are plant cell wall oppositions you can see here in red, form at the site of fungal penetration. And these papillas are normally successfully penetrated by the fungus in the MLO wild type. And this is different in the MLO mutant line where the papilla are enlarged and often not successfully penetrated by the fungus. This correlates with less fungal colonization. And this really tell us that MLO loss of function mutations reduce colonization by pathogenic fungi in the leaves, but it also uh, reduces the accommodation of beneficial root endophytic fungi in, in, in the roots. And this was shown uh, recently also for early mycorrhizal colonization with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi in MLO mutants of barley, wheat, and medicago truncatula, suggesting that we indeed need to come up with uh, novel strategies for resilient plant cultivars that favor accommodation of microbes with beneficial functions. But in order to make an informed decision, what we really need is to understand the molecular basis of multipartite interactions. And in my group, but also in other groups within um, CEPLAS, we are specifically interested in two aspects. One is how plant immune system can simultaneously accommodate beneficial microorganisms and fight against, uh, against pathogens. And the second aspect we are interested in is the metabolic interdependencies between the plant and the microorganism. And we now know that these two aspects are very strongly interlinked. And a major discovery in the past years uh, among several PIs in CEPLAS was that the plant phosphate starvation response and secondary metabolism, such as glucosinolates, uh, produced by Arabidopsis thaliana are linked to innate immunity for controlled accommodation of microbiota members. So there is a real trade-off between fungi and bacteria, and this is regulated by the uh, phosphate availability to, to the host. And in my group, we uh, decided to use a reductionist approach with well-established model organisms to address the specific and simple but important question, are beneficial and detrimental effects of a particular microbes retained in the presence of a stable synthetic community? This is, as, of course, some implication for application, as we know now that consortia, so if we put together the right bacteria and fungi, these are more resilient in the environment than just single strains. So they can, you know, survive longer in the, in the field and help the plants grow in. And this is also helping to address the question, can we engineer beneficial microbial communities that contribute to plant health and growth? And to answer this question, what we did was to establish different synthetic community among different PIs at, uh, at CEPLAS. And these are, for example, Garrido Ota and Paul schulz refer at the Max Planck Institute, but also Davide Bulgarelli at the University of Dundee. And this synthetic community were isolated either from the roots of Arabidopsis thaliana or from the rhizosphere of barley. And how do we do the selection of our synthetic community? So how we produce uh, them? We do this in two phases, the, the construction phase that involves establishment of model microbial culture collection from plants grown in contrasting natural environments and microbial whole genome sequencing of pure strains. And the second phase is the reconstruction phase that includes microbiota reconstruction experiments using neotobiotic plant system to test the impact of different microbial communities on plant fitness parameters, such as disease resistance, as we will see in the next slides, but also nutrient acquisition and abiotic stress tolerance. So how do we select this? members of the synthetic community. This is based mainly on phylogenetic um, 
diversity, so you want to have a high diversity in, in, in your synthetic community, but it's also based on the interaction network. So we know nowadays that some bacteria or some fungi, they have a more prominent uh, function in the synthetic community. And if they're not present, then this is not stable for testing hypothesis. And the last way of selecting um, members for synthetic community is, of course, based on functions. So if you, if you are interested in, in specific traits like growth promotion and or pro, um, protection, then you will have to introduce specific microbes that can display in a community context this trait. And this is what we have done, and we end up with two synthetic communities. And uh, before testing them in our plants, what we did was to check if our root endophytic fungi are present regularly in Arabidopsis thaliana from environmental analysis. And what we did was to reanalyze the OTUs for Sebacinales from the Tiergard et al. paper that was published last year. And what we observed here was that actually OTUs for Sebacinales are in reached in the rhizoplan, but also inside the roots of Arabidopsis thaliana. So this suggests that the bacinales are widely distributed in healthy Arabidopsis plants at different European locations. And this indicates that there is a functional endophytic association with this host in nature. But what is this function that we are looking at? And in order to answer this question, what we did was to challenge Arabidopsis thaliana with the fungal pathogen. This is bipolaris sorokiniana, which is quite aggressive and display disease symptoms in Arabidopsis, which we can monitor with photosynthetic activity, as you can see here. So the presence of the pathogen bipolaris sorokiniana leads to a decreased photosynthetic activity. And when we introduce Serendipita dermifera in the system, this is protecting from the attack of bipolaris sorokiniana. And if we now look at the activity of the synthetic community that was isolated from Arabidopsis, what we see is that this is also capable of protecting the roots of Arabidopsis thaliana from this pathogen. But in combination with the root endophytic fungus, we observe a synergistic effect. And if we now use a non-native bacterial synthetic community from barley on Arabidopsis, what we see, and this can be monitored via ion leakage, which is a proxy for cell dead, is that we induce ion leakage in the presence of the synthetic community from barley. And in the presence of the pathogens, this is additive. The nice uh, effect here is that the presence of the root endophytic fungus can decrease disease symptoms, and this correlates also with decreased pathogen colonization. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that the combined effect of bacteria plus a root endophytic fungus does not just increase the tolerance of the plants towards the uh, pathogen, but really make it more resistant to it. So the conclusion here is that one of the physiological rules of beneficial fungal and bacterial root endophytes is to protect Arabidopsis thaliana roots against pathogens. And if we now move from Arabidopsis to barley, we observe a similar uh, effect. So if we challenge barley roots with the pathogen bipolaris sorokiniana, we see a quite clear disease symptoms already at six days post-infection. And this is completely protected by the presence of Serendipita vermifera. And we also see here a synergistic effect by the addition of synthetic bacterial communities. And we could largely recapitulate this in confrontation assays without the plant host. This suggests that when bacteria and root endophytes act together, they are quite strong in antagonizing the growth of uh, the pathogen bipolaris sorokiniana. So the conclusion here was that protection mediated by Serendipita vermifera and bacteria is synergistic and largely independent of the host. If we now move from the trait protection to the trait growth promotion, then what we observe is that at early time points of six days post inoculation, we see a synergistic growth promotion effect with combination with specific bacteria and Serendipita vermifera. So this suggests that Serendipita vermifera confers plant growth promotion in cooperation with selected root associated bacteria. And via RNA sequencing analysis, we could show that 
the inter-kingdom synergistic beneficial activities that are associated with the growth promotion trade and the protection trade are not associated with extensive OS transcriptional reprogramming, but rather with the modulation of expression of microbial effectors and carbohydrate active enzymes. And I think that the analysis, the functional analysis of the microbial effectors and the carbohydrate active enzymes will lead to novel discoveries that will be also important for applied agronomics. So, and with this, I am at the end of my presentation and I would like to thank the people that are in my group and specifically also those people that um, I presented the data from and they are listed over here. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alga. We will now continue with the presentation uh, by Mechthild. Thank you, um, Eva and everybody um, for the invitation um, to present here in this um, great um, interaction on environment. And following um, Alga's presentation um, on the importance of interaction between plants and uh, endophytes, I would like um, to address um, the, um, uh, the plant side and uh, talk about plant nutrient uptake, um, then the assimilation of the nutrients into a form that's usable for the plants, how plants transport nutrients to organs where they are needed for growth, um, as well as the importance of transport processes uh, for plant performance and nutrient use efficiency. So my lab um, works also with Arabidopsis, but um, as a model plants, but we also perform quite some research with tropical and temperate legumes. Uh, peas and uh, the soya bean and recent studies we also extended to rice and wheat. Um, the nutrients we are interested in is uh, are carbon and sulfur, but a major focus on our research is on uh, nitrogen. And you probably all know that nitrogen is an extremely important um, nutrient. It's in agriculture systems mainly acquired from the soil uh, by uptake of nitrate and ammonium and in, for, in case of uh, nodulated legumes, they're able to fix the atmospheric nitrogen. But these, once they're taken up, these forms are not usable for the plants. So they need to be assimilated into amino acids. And photosynthesis provide the carbon skeleton and the energy for this process, why in turn, the amino acids are essential for, uh, for the synthesis of the photosynthetic machinery. So there is a really tight interconnection between um, these uh, two metabolic pathways. Once the amino acids are synthesized, uh, they're used within the cell for metabolism, but also very important is that there are the main nitrogen transport form uh, in plants. Uh, when we look at the importance of amino acids itself, they are not only the building blocks of proteins and enzymes, they also provide the nitrogen for synthesis of nucleic acid, uh, but many, many other compounds such as chlorophyll and hundreds of other nitrogen uh, metabolites that are, for example, uh, important for plant defense against pathogens or stress tolerance against other uh, environmental factor, or they are also essential for establishing food quality. In general, the supply of nitrogen and its so sufficient supply of nitrogen and its allocation uh, within the plants are strongly essential for establishing growth um, of vegetative uh, organs, but also for developing uh, flowers and other reprodu reproductive tissues um, during later phase of development, such as um, obviously the seeds. And um, the amount um, and allocation is essential to finally establish uh, yield and um, therefore um, for food production. Um, 
as uh, Alga already mentioned, um, the I need to put this away here. It's, um, as Alga already mentioned, nitrogen um, is has been a, re a very important component of the green revolution, and um, by introducing synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, uh, but the problem but and over the last decades um, application of nitrogen fertilizer in addition to um, improvements in crop genetics and agronomy led to huge yields however this has become at the cost um, for the environment as plants are often not able to fully uptake this uh, nitrogen in fact often only uh, around 50% or even less of the nitrogen may be taken up. So and a lot of the nitrogen is lost into the environment, which then uh, causes damage to the um, ecosystem, um, reduces air quality, and also, as uh, Alga already told you, contributes to uh, uh, global climate change. So one strategy um, to uh, circumvent I can't forward it. Something happens here. It's strange. Okay, now it's going. Um, so one strategy is to um, um, to uh, circumvent this problem and to uh, reduce nitrogen input while. Uh, increasing or at least maintaining crop productivity is the production of, the, of, of, of crop plants that show improved use, uh, nitrogen use efficiency for crop production. Um, but this is only possible when we can develop plants that are effective in taking up nitrogen, in distributing the nitrogen throughout the plant, and in finally utilizing the shoot nitrogen for seed uh, production. And I, I would like to point out that this is not only important for developed country um, to establish sustainable uh, agriculture and reduce nitrogen input, but it's also important for developed in countries uh, which actually don't have a lot of fertilizer and have uh, display reduced uh, crop yields. So uh, improving nitrogen use efficiency would also benefits, uh, would be a strong benefits for these uh, area on, in, on this planet. So let's look at uh, nitrogen uh, nutrition. So plants take up, as I said, the inorganic form, and then they are reduced either in the roots or in the source leaves to amino acids. When they are reduced uh, in the roots, the amino acids are moved in the vascular xylem towards the leaves where they are used for metabolism, or they are loaded into um, the phloem uh, for allocation towards the sink, and the sink might be uh, roots or developing fruits um, or seeds. Uh, for these uh, translocation processes of amino acids, transport proteins are essential, and there are at least two bottlenecks when we look at the allocation of amino acids from leaves to seeds. And one is the loading of amino acids into the phloem, and the second is the import of uh, the amino acids into the developing embryo. And we and other labs um, have identified over the last years um, a number of transport proteins that are important for embryo loading as well as uh, for uh, phloem loading. And one of the examples is um, the amino acid uh, permease 8. Um, this is a transport protein which uh, moves large amounts of amino acids uh, across membranes. Um, and it's also not very specific. So it, it transports a broad spectrum of protein amino acids. When we knock out this transporter, um, and then look at the effects on long distance transport of amino acids. So that's shown here in green are the mutants um, and in yellowish is the wild type. You see a huge reduction of amino acids in the phloem. 
So telling you that this transporter is essential for this loading process and also affects the amount of amino acids that are moved from the leaves towards the seeds. The effect is that when you reduce uh, allocation, there is much less fruits uh, produced. There are less seeds per fruit uh, between 7 and 16%. And this overall leads to a strong reduction in seed yield by up to 40%. Uh, again, this transporter is essential for supplying developing sinks with the nitrogen. And when you knock it out, then it has obviously a negative effect. But it also suggests that when you increase fluid loading, you could potentially also improve seed development. And in addition, if you want to um, improve at the same time protein levels in developing uh, in, in mature seeds, uh, one strategy may also, also be to add additional transporter in at the seed end to move more amino acids into um, the developing embryo. And this is an approach that we did in pea plants we concurrently expressed additional amino acid transporters um, in the phloem of the leaves as well as at the seed end uh, in the embryo. And this amino acid transporter is called AAP1. When we first looked at the effects on source sink allocation by uh, analyzing the phloem amino acid levels, we were quite amazed. We saw a huge increase in amino acid levels in the phloem by over 200%. And uh, analysis of the seed protein uh, shows you that there was a significant increase by uh, about to 20% in the soluble protein of these seeds, uh, telling you that um, the allocation change of amino acids strongly improves the protein levels within the seeds. We then looked at the effects on seed development. And in addition, we um, addressed, I wanted to know if the amount of nitrogen that you apply to these plants has an effect on seed yield. Um, and so we exposed the plants to high nitrogen levels, shown here on the right, to uh, limiting nitrogen, that's half of the amount of nitrogen supplied, and to deficient nitrogen, which is only 20% of the original nitrogen fertilization. And what you can see here in this graph, in beige, the wild type, and in green, the AAP1 plants, it, it doesn't matter how much nitrogen you give these plants, the AAP1 plants always outperform the wild type. So it's really, it's a general genetic uh, improvement um, in, in these plants by uh, changing um, the amino acid partitioning. But even... What's more important is when you compare the AAP1 plants here under limiting nitrogen with the wild type under high nitrogen, they have the same yield. So you can reduce the amount of nitrogen by half and you still get the same yield when you change partitioning processes in these um, AAP1 plants. And um, this also indicates that these plants display an increased nitrogen use efficiency. And in fact, in, under each of these nitrogen uh, fertilization uh, regimes, uh, nitrogen use efficiency is increased. But even more amazing is when you compare again the wild type under high with the amino uh, with the AAP1 plants under limiting nitrogen. This relates to a huge increase in nitrogen use efficiency by over 100%. So the, this tells you that these AAP1 plants um, are actually outperforming wild type under all nitrogen uh, conditions. They produce more proteins, they produce more yield, and they, exp uh, they uh, uh, display a large increase in nitrogen use efficiency. So the last, uh, the next thing what we were interested in is, can we uh, also increase the nutritional quality by changing amino acid transport processes? 
And um, so one aspect of nutrition quality is sulfur, which influences the protein uh, quality in seeds by accumulating higher amounts of proteins that, that contain the sulfur containing amino acid methionine. And you probably know methionine is an essential amino acid for human and mammalians. Uh, we cannot synthesize methionine and have to take it up via nutrition. To, uh, but there's one problem. So the protein uh, food, uh, like uh, legume seeds, they are often very low in um, methionine. Um, and so therefore reducing the nutritive uh, quality of the seeds. Um, so to overcome this limitation, we expressed uh, a methionine transporter. This is a specific transporter for methionine uh, in, in the phloem again and in the embryo to push more methionine into the phloem and pull more of this methionine into um, the seeds. And this approach has been highly successful. What, what we could see is that actually these plants take up more sulfate from the environment, assimilate more sulfur into uh, methionine and other organic sulfur compounds, and move more sulfur from the leaf finally to uh, the developing seeds. In addition, what these plants do is they co-regulate nitrogen uptake and allocation. So not only more sulfur is finally allocated towards developing seeds and sinks, but also more nitrogen. Together, this is uh, affecting seed yield. So we see an increase in total seed yield by up to 10%. But more exciting is we also see an increase in seed protein levels by up to 23%. And what's really exciting was is that we not only see an increase in the sulfur poor proteins, but also a huge increase in um, total seed protein yields uh, for the sulfur rich um, storage proteins in these plants. And Finally, something is always happening here. Yes, go. So, so finally, I, I would also uh, like to address or at least mention our research um, that I um, on, on nodulated or nitrogen fixing legume. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, these plants are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that house uh, in the nodules, in the root nodules shown here. Um, and it depends on the legumes. In case of temperate legumes, uh, this following fixation, this nitrogen is reduced to amino acids, which then uh, serve as a long distance transport form of nitrogen. But in tropical legumes like soya bean, urides are synthesized and then allocated from, rod, uh, from the nodules finally to the shoots. And we have done numerous studies addressing um, urides and amino acid partitioning processes in these nodulated legumes. Um, and in a nutshell, we see a similar importance in these nitrogen fixing legumes as we have found um, in the non fixing plants. And um, so this is that these overall that these amino acid transporters are essential in moving uh, nitrogen from um, source to sink, and obviously in case of amino acid transporters, also the sulfate. Um, they are essential or they're regulating um, sulfur and nitrogen acquisition and source sink physiology and affect sink development. They uh, exert regulatory control over nitrogen and sulfur metabolism, and overall their function impact the amount of vegetative growth and the biomass production, seed yield, uh, seed protein yield, as well as the quality um, of the proteins. And as I've shown you, um, these partitioning processes are important for plant nitrogen use efficiency. And what I didn't have time to, uh, for to go into detail is these partitioning processes do affect 
legume bacteria interaction and uh, recent work also uh, indicates that they have a function in plant environmental stress response. However, I hope uh, most importantly that I have convinced you that altering transport processes in plants present an important strategy for improving plant performance and also nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, without, um, you know, research discovery wouldn't really be possible without um, a, a great team and great uh, contribution from the students. Um, and I have been lucky um, um, so in, in, my, uh, in my lab. This is actually a picture of more recent students uh, and postdocs in my lab. Um, and uh, a big thank you for, for their engagement uh, and their contributions. And I also would like to, um, to acknowledge my collaborations as well as funding through NSF, um, USDA and the United Soya Bean Board. Without um, their support, this research wouldn't have been possible. And uh, finally, I, I would like to reinforce that um, plant performance or many factors uh, affect plant performance and therefore what's needed is a holistic understanding of physiological, biochemical or de 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 developmental processes and also um, looking at plants in diverse uh, environment. And we hope to tackle this challenge through these collaborations between WSU and uh, C plus um, involving actually an amazing number of labs. Um, so 36 research labs and scientists from a very diverse spectrum of uh, research areas. And part of the collaboration is uh, exchange and training of students, um, potential sabbaticals of lead PIs in the collaborative labs, um, but also, um, as Eva mentioned, um, you know, these bi-weekly seminars um, where um, a WSU and the C-plus faculty um, present or deliver their research in tandem. Um, in, um, so uh, we, we aim to, to really build a tour de force to resolve some of these complex traits and also uh, to better understand the effects you know, of uh, future climate on uh, plant performance. And with that, I would like to hand it back to Eva. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alga and Mechtel, to both of you for letting us learn about and from your fascinating research on sustainable solutions in architecture and the second green revolution that is needed and the differences between you know the classical breeding and the genomic techniques and the fungi and the roots and this extreme importance of nitrogen Mechtil, that you mentioned for the plant growth and thus for the food production and just to name a few highlights thank you so much i learned a lot we're now um, turning it to a q a everyone you can type a q into the chat if you would like to unmute and ask your uh, question yourself or you can, of course, also type your question into the chat. We will try our best to uh, get to everyone's questions, but uh, might not be able to. So uh, let me see. Uh, we will first go to Andrea Sveba. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, Eva, for giving me the chance to ask the question. And that goes to Mechtild. And it's really a simple question. And you may have said it in the talk, and I simply missed it. In your experiments where you overexpressed AAP1 mm -hmm. in P, yeah. that was, um, yeah. were, were these P plants axenic or um, were they actually um, colonized? So, no, sorry, though, I, I forgot to mention that. So, these P plants um, were not non fixing, so they're, they're we're really relying on nitrogen fertilizer because mm -hmm. that's really a more complex issue, right? When you fertilize and nodulate, so that's often down regulates nodulation and fixation. So, so, but nevertheless, what we st so a student in my lab, Rachel Schneider, is starting to look at our plants also under nitrogen fixing conditions, right? Yes. So, 
-hmm. So, because what's happening obviously in soils when these plants are exposed to the, you know, in the field, so they see actually both, right? So they will see uh, nitrogen in the soil, but also potentially be able to fix nitrogen um, from the atmosphere. And it's it's really important, you know, to get this, you know, how do they regulate it? You know, how much is uptake versus fixation? Um, and how little nitrogen do you actually need, if at mm -hmm. all, right, when you fertilize mm -hmm. them? I mean, we have done these studies in, in, in soya bean, as you probably know, where we nodulate our plants and don't give them any fertilizer. And these plants, they, they fix over 100% more nitrogen from the atmosphere. These plants are, we, are, we put them, you know, but important is we obviously need to test plants in the field, right? And in the collaboration with Felix, um, um, we in Missouri, um, Fritchie in Missouri, we, we put these in the field. We, in the greenhouse, we see more seeds because we grow them big, right? And they're not not in small rows or whatever. So, so we put them in the field, they get less seeds compared to in the greenhouse. However, their protein level seems to be up regulated, which is important and which actually what actually the soya bean breeders really want to see because the quality of the leftovers when you produce oils of this, um, you know, for, for feeding, it's really low because the breeding was spread away from protein levels in seeds. Very cool. Thank you. And like, you, as you mentioned, field trials, I mean, that is something we are very jealous about from, from a European perspective, because it's almost impossible here. And again, lots of opportunities opening for the collaboration just on this yeah. Yeah. aspect. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Andreas. And thank you, Mechtel. The next question is by Laura Rose. Please unmute. Hi. I have a question for Alga. And it has to do with the, um, you showed data where the barley microbiome on Arabidopsis didn't help it. It actually made things worse as far as I remember. And so it shows or it indicates that the plant has to experience its own sort of correct microbiome with the positive impact. But often in crop systems, we, we practice crop rotation. So my question is, what would you advise? Because if you're constantly, and we have specific regimes where we go from say a, a monocot to a dicot and then a monocot, or maybe three different crops that we rotate in general. And that's done because it usually provides a benefit. But what you're showing is that this, the resident microbial community um, for it to have the positive impact, you needed to match it with its host um, for the bacteria to, to look positive. Yes, thanks, Laura. This is actually an excellent question. And the idea behind is that, of course, if you do a field rotation, you will have competition, but you will also have, and this is based on several studies, higher diversity of microorganisms. So that is probably supporting, you know, the, the, um, the, the coping of the plants and in the next season, the coping of a different plant species with this, uh, with this higher diversity of microorganisms. And this is a, a very important point. So diversity is, is key. And of course, our synthetic community, these are isolated from a specific uh, environment where you had um, these this, um, microbes associated with one specific host, host plant in that specific moment. So we know that Arabidopsis has a quite similar um, community associated to its roots, independent of, of the geographical area. And I think what is important here to know is that um, there will be some specialization. And uh, this is also shown in another work from uh, Ruben Garrido Ota, where they have done similar um, exercises, so to say, with lotus versus Arabidopsis. And they also not notice that uh, the lotus syncom perform better in lotus and the Arabidopsis syncom perform better in Arabidopsis. So I think the key point here is, is really to increase diversity and keep this diversity in the field. Thank you very much. We, I'm just getting a note. Thank you uh, that we can run over just a few minutes. So next question from Pia Sake. 
Yes, thank you. I actually had exactly the same question as Laura Rose in the beginning, uh, but maybe as a follow up. So you said that um, like then we have a high diversity in the soil. So how can we make sure that we then actually see the positive phenotype that we see, like if we only use the synthetic community? Don't you think that it will be sub uh, like deprived then not so? So active or something? Okay, so the the, the synthetic the synthetic community this has to come so to have a specific traits and to perform fine in a specific environment, they have to be, you know, linked to this specific environment. So if you isolate synthetic if you if you produce synthetic community from a soil which is uh, you know deprived of phosphate, then you will have an enrichment for microbes with functions in, you know, delivering phosphate to the host plant. But of course, if you use the synthetic community on, on a field which there is, which has uh, enough phosphate, the activity is, is not improved. So the idea of the synthetic community is to use, or biologicals generally, is to use them in environment where you have problems due to, for example, eye fertilization or monocultures, and there there is somehow uh, soil uh, erosions and deprivation, so you have already some issues. And this could be due to the fact that you are using already a lot of phosphate or you're using plants that are coping well under these conditions with high nutritional uh, um, Import, input, but then suddenly you cannot use uh, phosphate anymore, or you cannot use nitrogen for different reasons. So the idea is to help, you know, to help the plants via the use of biologicals, and this should be integrative to normal and classical traditional farming, and is not particularly relevant probably in Europe where we use a lot of uh, fertilization at the moment. But if you imagine the situation in, 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 in some, um, in some uh, areas in Africa, for instance, where you have really poor soil, then this will, um, will, will support uh, the growth of your plants. Okay. Last question we have typed in the chat, somebody from the United Nations. I guess this goes to Mechtild, I would think. Could you integrate both AAP1 and MUP? Well, that's an excellent question. That's something we are right now working on. So what we did is we we crossed our P plans. So um, so the AAP one plans and the MUP plans, and we do have actually some other lines which are which I couldn't didn't have time to talk about, which we also crossed. So so yes. So what we hope is um, maybe I should reinforce. So these AAP one plants they do bulk flow, so they produce they move a lot of amino acids from source to sink. Whereas these MUP plants obviously they are more specific for some for for the methionine. Um, so, and by combining it, we hope to re even, you know, elevate this positive effect, which we are seeing um, and produce even more, more uh, protein, but also more uh, of the high quality protein. Yes, we are working on it. Hopefully we will know more soon. <laughs> perfect. I think this is a perfect um, closing statement. We are working on it and we hope it will get even better soon. Thank you so much, Alga and Mechtild, for letting us deep dive, quick but deep, into your uh, fascinating research and also to learn how the transatlantic collaboration actually can help tackle all those future, important future challenges together. You see all the applause you're getting. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to the DVIH and to the German Research Foundation and to all the other partners. And thank you to all of you who joined us today for the Food Fix, Super Plants, Microbe Sidekicks and Nutrien Heroes. We hope you can uh, join us again for the next Transatlantic Tandem Talk, which will be held on June 23rd. Have a nice day or evening, everyone.